Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Managing and Monitoring Inflammatory Bowel Disease. I am Sabrina Lemus of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin. For more information, please visit diasorin.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Your questions will be answered via email um, following the broadcast. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window. Report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow that process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Anita Afzali, um, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine and Gastroenterologist that specializes in inflammatory bowel disease at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Afzali, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Hello, my name is Anita Apsali. I'm a gastroenterologist practicing at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, where I'm the medical director of our OSU Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center. So today we're going to discuss managing and monitoring inflammatory bowel disease, and specifically the role of fecal calprotectin. I do have some financial disclosures as listed here. So we have three objectives for my talk today. First, we're going to describe inflammatory bowel disease or IBD and specifically its pathophysiology and epidemiology. I'd like for us to understand the treat to target goals in IBD. And then we're also specifically again going to review the role of fecal calprotectin or FC in IBD. So as a way of a background, let's talk about the epidemiology of IBD. Inflammatory bowel disease is an idiopathic chronic inflammatory disease. For Crohn's disease, it's really any part of the gastrointestinal tract that's involved. So we say from mouth to anus. And then for ulcerative colitis, as the name implies, the inflammation is limited only to the colon. Inflammatory bowel disease is characterized by both activation or really dysregulation of the immune system. There's periods of remission where the patient is feeling very well and their clinical disease and as well as their mucosal disease is under control. And then periods of relapse where their inflammation is significant, they're having severe symptoms and they are flaring. These symptoms vary widely based on both location as well as severity of disease. Now, it's important to note that inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, is not irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. Traditionally, we've regarded inflammatory bowel disease to be primarily in a westernized type of disease pattern, specifically in the North American or Northern European countries. Before the 1980s, these areas did in fact have the highest prevalence of disease. But by contrast, as you can see here, since 1990, the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease has increased in the industrialized countries, as you can see here for Crohn's disease, and the same applies for ulcerative colitis. This increase in incidence has been evident over time as described both for ulcerative colitis as well as for Crohn's disease. And although previously thought to be primarily a Caucasian disease, we're actually seeing that the incidence and the prevalence is increasing among different racial or ethnic groups. So what sort of symptoms does a patient with ulcerative colitis have? Well, certainly there's change in bowel patterns or bowel movement. There's an increased report of stool frequency as well as the consistency also varies and changes. There's abdominal pain, mostly left-sided, uh, reported as cramping. That's also relieved with defecation. There's that incomplete feeling of 
a full bowel movement or an incomplete feeling of evacuation of that, and that's labeled as tenismus, and then bloody stools. We do use a clinical instrument called a simple colitis activity index in clinic to be able to evaluate the type of symptoms reported by our patients. For Crohn's disease, based off of where the patient's disease is located, that's where their symptoms will occur. So specifically, if they have mostly colonic disease, they can have diarrhea. If they have mostly small bowel disease, they can have more abdominal pain and constipation as opposed to diarrhea. Weight loss, fever, rectal bleeding, all of these symptoms can be reported by our patients, again, based off of the location of their Crohn's disease. A clinical instrument, excuse me, a clinical instrument that we use is the Harvey Bradshaw Index or HBI. For endoscopic features of inflammatory bowel disease, for ulcerative colitis, again, this is primarily inflammation in the colon, and so this is a contiguous circumferential inflammatory process that starts in the rectum and then can progress left-sided or even pan-colonic. Crohn's disease is more of a patchy disease within the colon, and then again, the involvement of the small bowel or elsewhere. The type of inflammation we see, I'll show you some pictures here. And then also the type of uh, disease phenotype that's based off of whether we see strictures or fistulas or other types of, of a phenotype progression based off of radiographic imaging as well. So let's look at some endoscopic pictures. So what is the role of colonoscopy in inflammatory bowel disease? Here I've shared three different pictures. We have the terminal ileum with the microvilli, then we have the normal colon. So in the middle and on the right side, we have pictures of a normal colon, normal vascular pattern, normal haustra or folds within the colon. This is not normal. So here for ulcerative colitis, you can see that the inflammation can be mild, can become more moderate or even significant or severe based off of the amount of inflammation and the severity of, of the inflammation we see within the lining of the colon or the mucosa of the colon. For Crohn's disease, we don't necessarily have a spectrum, but certainly the type of lesions that we see tells us how severe or significant the disease is. So on the top left, you see small aphthous ulcers, but then you see more severe ulcerations, the, the cratered ulcer-like lesions that you see in the top right, the serpiginous linear ulcerations that you see in the bottom left, as well as severe ulceration, stricture scarring and a cobblestone pattern of the mucosa that you see on the bottom right. So how do we diagnose inflammatory bowel disease? Well, basically we have to, of course, gather a history from our patients. What type of symptoms are they having? If physical examination is important, laboratory testing is also very important for us to be able to evaluate if there's evidence of anemia, for example, malabsorption of the other vitamins or nutrients biomarkers, and we will discuss the role of fecal calprotectin, stool studies to rule out an infection, endoscopy, cross-sectional imaging, again, specifically for Crohn's disease and to evaluate the disease phenotype specifically within the small bowel, as well as other additional diagnostic studies as listed out here. So when we talk about managing a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, it's extremely important to make the diagnosis quickly and accurately. We need to be able to differentiate between disease activity and disease severity. We need to be able to help our patients feel better. Patient reported outcomes is a very important and we need to make sure that their symptoms are under control and their quality of life is back to their baseline. We need to be able to induce remission rapidly and maintain a steroid-free remission over time. We call this deep remission, where we've not only achieved clinical remission, but also mucosal healing. So we've been able to achieve mucosal healing when we're evaluating by endoscopy or other measures. We know that this is all very important because this in totality helps modify or improve the long-term disease outcomes for our patients with inflammatory bowel disease.
In turn, we're able to avoid hospitalizations, surgery, a disabling disease course. We're able to reduce the steroid exposure, opioids exposure, and we reduce costs of care for managing our patients. Now, at present, our current evaluation, whether we're using those clinical instrument scores that I mentioned earlier, or even by endoscopy, all of that is truly a cross-sectional assessment of how our patient is doing today. In other words, the short-term activity of their disease. The disease severity includes elements of a prognosis for the patient specifically to be able to predict how is their disease going to do over time. So from here, you can see that there are certainly prognostic factors, either for Crohn's disease or for ulcerative colitis, which helps us predict over time, how much at risk are they for their disease to progress? for their disease to potentially require hospitalization, steroids, surgery, et cetera. So for Crohn's disease, that moderate or high risk factors as listed out here, and the same for ulcerative colitis where we have high risk factors as listed out. Why is this important? Again, as you can see from this picture, we really only have a small window of opportunity to improve the disease control symptoms, and potentially avoid the natural progression of the disease, which could become a stricturing, fibrostenotic, fistulizing disease course. So if we are able to target the specific targets that I'll talk to you about, we could potentially change the natural progression of the disease and potentially reduce or eliminate the risk of the patient's disease progressing to a fibrostenotic stricturing disease course. And in turn, we could potentially avoid surgeries for our patients with Crohn's disease, as well as hospitalizations, need for steroids, or having other debilitating factors related to their disease. The same goes for ulcerative colitis. With better disease control, we could improve the inflammation within their colon and even reduce their risk for colon cancer, for example. And so we know that if we control the inflammation, in turn, our patients do better and it results in better outcomes, long-term outcomes for our patients. So how do we approach this? Well, importantly, we've recognized over time that certainly we want our patients to feel better, but we need to move to more objective measures or targets. So of course, again, our goal is to be able to have our patients respond to treatment. And with that response, they, improve, they have improved symptoms and an improved quality of life. But if, we are, if our goal is remission or more so deep remission, you can see that we want to not only improve their symptoms, we want to eliminate their symptoms that they previously had. We want to achieve normal laboratory or biomarkers. We want to achieve a normal endoscopy. We want to achieve mucosal healing. And from those goals, you can see that we're not only able to improve quality of life, but we're reducing the disabling disease course potentially for our patients, including reducing, reducing risk for disability or minimizing that, reducing the risk or potentially avoiding surgery. So it's important for us to have a sustained disease control with achieving the deep remission and utilizing these objective treat to targets. So what should these objective targets be? Well, this was a stride group, an international group, which basically helped us determine what some of these targets should be, whether we're discussing ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So for ulcerative colitis, the patient reported outcomes and specifically a resolution of rectal bleeding and diarrhea or their ultra bowel habits, as well as endoscopic remission. And we use an endoscopy Mayo scoring system. And so an endoscopic score of zero to one is and should be our targets for managing our patients with ulcerative colitis. Histologic remission is an adjunctive goal. For Crohn's disease, again, of course, our targets should be that we want our patients to feel better, patient reported outcomes, and specifically resolution of abdominal pain and diarrhea or their ultra bowel habits, as well as endoscopic remission. So again, a resolution of the inflammation or ulcerations 
excuse me, or ulceration seen on ileocolonoscopy, as well as resolution of findings of inflammation seen on cross-sectional imaging, again, for the patient with small bowel Crohn's disease, for example. So these are objective targets that we should aim for our patients in order to achieve better outcomes. Now, biomarker remission, whether it's a normalization of their C-reactive protein or their fecal calprotectin, has now been considered an adjunctive target. And so do, does this matter? And the quick answer and short answer is yes. Achieving a treat to target for our patients, not only is it possible, but we're able to have better outcomes for our patients, and that's our goal. So this was a retrospective study to determine whether a real-world practice of treat to target is possible. So one group basically performed the normal approach without achieving or attempting to achieve mucosal healing, and the other group attempted that more stringently or specifically. Specifically. So from the group that was able to apply the treat to target approach for mucosal healing with making dose adjustments to the patient's therapy, you can see that in fact mucosal healing was achieved as was histologic healing. And so with this, these patients had a better treatment as well as a management outcome course. The COM study was an additional study and a more recent study that demonstrated that the treat to target approach leads to superior endoscopic outcomes as well as those the deep remission outcomes as I described earlier. So two different groups randomized to either the typical clinical management group that we used before, which was basically assessing whether our patients are feeling better, providing steroids when needed, and mostly monitoring symptoms. Then there was the treat to target group, which was now not only driven by symptoms, because that is again, a, the patient reported outcomes and symptoms reported is and should be our target, but also utilizing some objective targets. And here, the objective target included fecal calprotectin, as well as the C-reactive protein, and then also evaluation of need for steroids for the patients. So dose modifications to their treatment, and specifically in this study, it was for adalimumab. Dose modifications were made based off of whether or not there was an elevation in these objective targets as listed. And from the COM study, we found that the treat to target approach was and helped achieve superior outcomes for our patients as opposed to the clinical management approach. Here, the patients had with being able to apply those inflammatory biomarkers, specifically fecal calprotectin C-reactive protein, you can see that the patients were able to achieve better mucosal healing, less deep ulcerations on the endoscopy that was performed as compared to clinical management and symptom management alone. So this is not anything new. In fact, we know, in fact, even since the early 1990s that Basically, the clinical outcomes does not correlate with endoscopic outcomes, nor does how one is feeling today impact what we will see over time on endoscopy with the amount of inflammation and scarring potentially that the patient will have. We also know, and what has been already described, is that if we achieve mucosal healing for our patients, whether Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, we are able to reduce their risk, reduce the need for surgical intervention. As described here for Crohn's disease, patients were less likely to require surgery for their Crohn's disease if mucosal healing was achieved and the same for ulcerative colitis. So how do we approach this? Well, it's important to make sure that we individualize our therapy and our treatment and our targets for each individual patient. So initially, as you can see here, we certainly want to make the initial accurate diagnosis. We need to be able to assess what our targets should be. We need to be able to adjust our therapy based off of whether or not our patients have achieved those targets. And we need to continuously monitor this. How do I propose this? Well, initially, again, based off of the STRIDE recommendations, patient reported outcomes are important, endoscopy is important, as well as any additional studies as listed out here. So imaging or interrography, laboratory tests. 
fecal calprotectin, you see that I've listed it out a few times here, and this is how I propose that we approach our treat-to-target management individualized for each of our patients. So here at baseline, it's important to obtain a fecal calprotectin and potentially monitoring and utilizing this biomarker over time to determine whether or not adjustments in therapy is necessary. So certainly today I'm not going to talk about all of our different therapies we have for managing our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, but more so to remind you that we have a medicine cabinet and regardless of which treatment we decide to initiate for our patients, we need to be able to monitor to ensure that our patients have achieved those targets as I described. So let's take a step and look at specifically at fecal calprotectin. What role does it have? Well, as you may know, fecal calprotectin or calprotectin is a calcium binding protein from the S100 family. It's a neutrophil protein found in both plasma and stool with levels about six times higher in the stool compared to the plasma. We do know that fecal calprotectin is increased in both a, a patient with a, an infection as well as inflammatory conditions or specifically inflammatory bowel disease. And we've learned that fecal calprotectin can be used as a non-invasive marker of neutrophilic intestinal inflammation. Specifically for us, practicing gastroenterology and IBD specifically, we have actually found that we've been able to differentiate whether our patient has inflammatory bowel disease from irritable bowel syndrome based off of fecal calprotectin. So here, compared to the other inflammatory biomarkers, whether it's C-reactive protein or ESR, you can see that a calprotectin cutoff value of 30 has a 100% sensitivity, 97% specificity for differentiating from Crohn's disease versus irritable bowel syndrome. Of note, I also want to remind you that about 30% of the general population does not mount a C-reactive protein or CRP response. Their liver does not mount that response regardless of whether they have an infection or inflammation. How good is calprotectin in diagnosing inflammatory bowel disease? Well, not only can we differentiate it, but we also know that based off of numerous studies, an elevated fecal calprotectin is consistent in, and also helpful in diagnosing inflammatory bowel disease, regardless of whether our patient is an adult patient or even a child. So a positive, there, what has been found in these studies is that there is a positive correlation of fecal calprotectin and fecal excretion. So this supports the hypothesis of a neutrophil migration into the gut lumen across any form of inflamed mucosa, again, either because of inflammatory bowel disease or because of an infection even. And based off of the newer assays that there are newer cutoff values suggested. How good is fecal calprotectin for assessment of endoscopic healing or histologic healing? Well, recall from my earlier slides, I mentioned to you again that the importance of endoscopic and even potentially histologic uh, healing. Again, we know that this improves outcomes. This is one of our targets, mucosal healing. So from this, you can see that it is in fact a good marker for disease activity. This was a study for evaluation of adults with active ulcerative colitis based off of both endoscopy as well as histology. And the study found that higher levels of fecal calprotectin was associated with active disease as opposed to mild or inactive ulcerative colitis. As described here, the median fecal calprotectin of active ulcerative colitis was 68 as compared to mild or no active disease of, of, of for ulcerative colitis being 11 and a half and in the control group a level of six. How good is fecal calprotectin for subclinical disease activity? In a patient with ulcerative colitis that's asymptomatic, but we know that they have ulcerative colitis, so we do know that we need to follow and monitor objective metrics or targets. So this was a multi-center cross-sectional study of about 370 patients. Two different forms of assays were used, the quantum blue as well as a fluoroamino assay. And from this, irrespective of which assay was used, the 
for detecting fecal calprotectin levels, there was a significant difference compared to ulcer colitis patients with or without histologic and or endoscopic disease activity. So on your right, you can see that the patient with active ulcer colitis based off of the Mayo score, so here you can see in blue, if they had less severe Mayo or endoscopic score, their fecal calprotectin was lower. The same goes based based off of whether we're using the Mayo score or the ulcerative colitis endoscopic score, again, a less severe endoscopy score was associated with less of a level of, or lower of a level of fecal calprotectin. The Gabo score is based off of histology. So if the histologic activity was low, again, fecal calprotectin was low compared to if the endoscopy score was higher or the histology score was higher, we do know that again, the patients, even if they are asymptomatic, we do know that it's associated with more active objective disease. For calprotectin for that subclinical disease activity, again, when we're looking at fecal calprotectin, and the lipocalin was another biomarker that they tested, fecal calprotectin was actually superior compared to bi the other biomarker lipocalin, and pretty uh, similar to the endoscopic or other, uh, the histologic assessment. But from here, the cutoff values of 150 or 250, again, based off of the, uh, the fecal calprotectin assay that was used, had a good balance for sensitivity, specificity, and the, both the positive as well as the negative predictive value. The overall accuracy as well as the CAPA index is as listed out here. How good is fecal calprotectin for evaluating response to treatment? Well, again, I'm highlighting to you that it's very important to make sure we've been able to achieve the, the targets as initially outlined for each individual patient. These objective targets or goals, and specifically of achieving mucosal healing, is extremely important. Well, in the past, the primary approach for that was endoscopy more another colonoscopy, another colonoscopy. Well, certainly we do know that this is an invasive procedure. It could be quite costly. It has risks involved. And let's be honest, most patients don't want to even have frequent endoscopic evaluation because of all the reasons as, uh, and their concerns as, uh, as we are well aware of. Now, we do know that despite mucosal healing being a goal, as far as a treatment or a treat to target goal, endoscopy based monitoring is performed only about 50% of the time after a patient is initiated on biologic therapy. And with fecal calprotectin, it's really only utilized about 5% of the time. So this was a recent study with pooled data from different phase two trials for both biologics, num numerous different biologics, as well as the oral small molecule tofacinib. And really it was pooled data to evaluate how well fecal calprotectin is in achieving endoscopic healing. And so from this, a fecal calprotectin of 50 or less had a sensitivity of 82%, specificity of 74% in evaluation or achieving uh, or diagnosing endoscopic healing. A fecal calprotectin, based off of the pooled individual data from the studies, a fecal calprotectin of greater than 250 had a sensitivity of 76% and a specificity of 79% in diagnosing endoscopic healing. So let's look at, and what the authors looked at was scenario-specific characteristics for fecal calprotectin. So from the first scenario, in order with uh, the patients with the individual data pool, with the fecal calprotectin of 50 or less, and the patients having a rectal bleeding score of zero or a stool frequency score, or SFS, of uh, zero or one, you can see that the positive predictive value for fecal calprotectin of less than 50 was 90% for those patients that had improved after induction of treatment and for the endoscopic improvement after maintenance of, the, of treatment, a fecal calprotectin of less than 50 had a positive predictive value of 
So from here, you can see that the fecal calprotectin performance decreases when the patient has increased stool frequency score and a fecal calprotectin of greater than 50 is not a good test in diagnosing, diagnosing endoscopic active disease. What about additional specific scenarios that we can potentially see how the uh, fecal calprotectin plays a role? So here, for a fecal calprotectin score of greater than 250 for moderate to severe endoscopic disease after induction, a rectal bleeding score of two or three or stool frequency score of two or three had a positive predictive value of 97% for a fecal calprotectin cutoff of 250 and for moderate to severe endoscopic disease maintenance, a positive predictive value of 95% for a fecal calprotectin cutoff of greater than 250. Here you can see again that the fecal calprotectin cutoff performance decreases when the fecal calprotectin level is less than 250 or rectal bleeding is less severe. So how or what would be a good proposed algorithm for both the patient reported outcomes and symptoms and the role for fecal calprotectin for evaluation of disease activity? So here is a good, great outline of an algorithm of how to approach this and the values as listed out here. So for the patient reported outcome, if they're in complete resolution of rectal bleeding or near normalization of stool frequency with a fecal calprotectin of less than 50, there's a very high likelihood of achieving treatment targets and specifically a high correlation with the Mayo endoscopy score of zero or one. So potentially in these patients, we don't need to do another or perform another colonoscopy, but rather base it on the fecal calprotectin level. For the patient with ongoing rectal bleeding symptoms, greater than 50% of their bowel uh, movements uh, having blood or passage of the blood, in the patient who has persistent stool frequency of greater than three stools above their baseline, and if their fecal calprotectin score is greater than 250, then this is associated with a very high likelihood of having moderate to severe endoscopic activity, a Mayo endoscopy score of two or three. And in these patients, you don't necessarily need to do a colonoscopy to determine whether they have active disease. And just based off of the fecal calprotectin and their symptoms, we know that they have active disease. What role does fecal calprotectin have for prediction of relapse? Well, inflammatory bowel disease, as I described at the start of my talk, has periods of remission and relapse. These clinical symptoms may not necessarily be a good assessment of how they're doing as far as their mucosal active inflammation. In fact, about 50% of our patients with inflammatory bowel disease have a functional component or a component of irritable bowel syndrome. Also, again, we do know that fecal calprotectin correlates very nicely with endoscopic as well as histological inflammation, as I shared with you. So for the patient to determine whether we could predict relapse, relapse with utilizing fecal calprotectin, this was a study and a reminder that yes, in fact, it is a good non-invasive marker for not only evaluation of active disease, but also for disease relapse. A cutoff value of 50 had a 13-fold increased risk or uh, telling us that our patient is at a 13-fold increased risk for a relapse of either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So putting this all together, again, there's multiple roles for fecal calprotectin in our treat-to-target approach in evaluation of a really objective evaluation of whether mucosal healing, endoscopic healing, histologic healing has been achieved in our patients. So how do I suggest putting this all together? Well, at baseline, at the initial time of diagnosis, it's important to obtain a fecal calprotectin. Determine what the level is at baseline. Over time, once you've initiated therapy, so the induction of treatment, response to the treatment, maintenance of therapy, during this time, I recommend obtaining a fecal calprotectin at least every three to six months, potentially even sooner, based off of how they're responding to the treatment you have initiated for the patient.
Certainly, if they're having a relapse in their disease, then the role of fecal calprotectin, as I demonstrated to you, is helpful. And then also for the patient who would like to discontinue their therapy. In this role, again, fecal calprotectin is important because it can also help predict the relapse, but then also determine if they've truly achieved mucosal healing. So in summary, remember that inflammatory bowel disease is a global disease. It's important to be able to differentiate disease activity, which is the short term. How is your patient currently doing from disease severity, which are really the long-term outcomes? How is your patient going to do over time, specifically if you have not achieved those targets as I described to you? Prognosis is based on each of the individual's disease factors. It's important for us to be able to individualize our targets for each of our patients. And certainly our patients don't want to have a colonoscopy every few months or weeks, even in the appropriate patient, for the obvious reasons that are well known. So it's very important to be able to better utilize some of these non-invasive biomarkers, such as fecal calprotectin. And I hope I've been able to demonstrate to you that Truly, fecal calprotectin plays a significant role for monitoring and managing the patient with inflammatory bowel disease. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions.